Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Hello, everybody. How are you? It's uh, the Ramble, and I am uh, Alex Bennett, and we're going to be here until uh, what, what time? Uh, we're going to be here till about midnight Eastern time on the United States uh, and the, on the right side of the United States of America, New York City, New York, New York. The city so nice they named it twice. But you know what we do every now and then? Once, once every three weeks, life really blossoms because we get to talk to Will Durst. I got my coffee. I got my coffee. That's Will Durst, and we are the Coffee Twins. Hey, buddy. What do How you, you do? What's your brand today that you're drinking? Oh, they got this uh, thing that they only sell in the beginning of the year, and it's called... Uh, uh can't oh supernatural is super it? supernatural oh yeah. really it was that pete's it's pete's and it's got a bit of a uh a blueberry through uh through a thing a, going. a blueberry note as they would yeah, say yeah. <laughs> yes a hint a hint of chocolate and uh yeah a dash so of, it's called uh, supernatural can you buy it ground yes okay i'm gonna send away for it i on your recommendation Cool. I don't know if it's still being available. I bought all mine in January. Oh, really? Okay. Well, do they do they do? Does Peach just do this kind of stuff where they, you know, every, you know, they they yeah, they do two months of a special coffee and then uh, they start over yeah. and do another one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Starbucks is pretty much the same all the time. What I'm what I'm drinking here is Death Wish coffee. Death Wish. Death Wish. I, oh, cool. I, I get it in cups from uh, K cups from uh, 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 Amazon, and it says it's the strongest coffee in the world. <laughs> Bullshit. Oh, really? No, I. You know something? No coffee seems to wake me up anymore. Maybe I'm quit, dead and I don't know it. <laughs> quit for two weeks. Oh, really? No coffee at all for two weeks. Oh, God. I know. <laughs> I know. Could I do it? I don't think so. I don't know. You know. Oh, you, yeah, and then when you start back, you could start at a really low level. Yeah. And th and that will give me the boost I need. Yeah. Do you know what I find is uh, uh, Pete's be uh, darkest, strongest is the French roast. The French roast. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll try that. I uh, I I also got these K cups of. Uh, uh, Starbucks Plus, it's supposedly two times the caffeine. I did not know they did that. Yeah, they do that, and it doesn't do a thing for me. <laughs> I do better just by a normal Pete's, uh, I can't remember what the name of it is I'm using, but something De La Tierra or something like that. Uh, yeah, De La Tierra, yeah. Yeah, and, and which I love. It's a great coffee. Uh, but the, anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, this is the Death Wish coffee, so if I drop dead while we're talking... You know, so of course. Uh, How I'll, you doing? How's New York? Uh, Is it cold? Oh, uh, it was. It's been really weird. It snows like a motherfucker, okay. And then by the next morning, the snow is gone. It's very strange. You know, it, it's warm. It's cold. It's warm. It's cold. Uh, it snows. It doesn't. Then it rains, and the rain washes away the snow, and it's very weird. So, I mean, I would love it to either be a winter wonderland out there or spring. Make up your mind. Yeah, don't fuck with me. I'm sorry. I'm too old for this f getting fucked with. Okay? So how you doing, Mr. Durst? Uh, well, see, that's the great thing about San Francisco. Because, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin. I, uh, I grew up in the Midwest. Yeah. And I think a couple of weeks ago, it was negative 22 degrees in in uh, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Oh boy. And it was 57 degrees here in San Francisco. And then this summer it'll be 110 degrees. You know, like in July or yeah. August, but it'll this... be 110 degrees in Sturgeon Bay 
and in San Francisco, it'll be 57. <laughs> 57 degrees. Actually, San Francisco, sometimes <coughs> you go, boy, we're having a heat wave when it's 90. Yeah. You know, but it very rarely gets to that. Usually, I always said about San Francisco, it's the world's only air conditioned city. You know, you can have a hot day, 90 degrees, nighttime comes, the fog rolls in, you're down to 57. Yeah, yeah. Right? Very now seldom we, see. We had one day two years ago in 2016 or 2017. I yeah. can't remember. It was September 8th. Mm -hmm. It got up to the highest recorded temperature in the history of San Francisco. It was 106. And I think in San Francisco, it's only gotten into triple digits three or four times in all recorded history. So this was 106. And people people were confused. <laughs> they, were, they were lying prone on the sidewalk, seeking the deep cool. You know? What was the temperature again? A hundred and six. Oh my God! Yeah. Well, a hundred and six. We would be screaming here in New York City I, too. You know. I mean, I was there uh, in August of eighty-seven, mm -hmm. and it got up to be a hundred and three. And we were taping our our first album uh, at Stand Up New York, mm -hmm. and it was me and Jimmy Tingle. And Barry Crimmins and Jim Morris, I think, the four of us, mm -hmm. and Buddy Mora had put together this label called Black Rose or something. And they did one for female comics, which was taped in L.A. But this, we did two shows, and the audience had to stand in line, and it was 103 degrees. Really? The, the smell of hot urine. You know? well, the, well, the trouble with New York is... If it gets hot in San Francisco, to begin with, is humidity is not a major factor. Right. Okay. In New York City, humidity is hell. I mean, a you know, you factor. can't keep a crease in your pants. You know, it's terrible. Everything uh, you wear feels like greasy saran wrap. Yeah. And, and uh, also, uh, there's the f factor of the concrete, that you're, this is a city that's completely surrounded by concrete. It's below you on the ground. It's uh, on either side of you with the buildings. You know, there, there's no, you could go out to Central Park and get a little relief from that. And I often thought that the best description of, the, of this kind of heat that we have in New York was the beginning of the uh, Love and Spoonful song, Summer in the City, that ba dum Bono. That is how it feels. Yeah. Hot town, summer in the city. Yeah. Back my yeah. neck, feeling dirty and gritty. <laughs> yeah. And boy, it it can get oppressive here in New York City during the summer. It's, yes. it, that's yes. why we all have air conditioners. You know, yeah. I you know we, we don't have air condition we never had air conditioners in San Francisco. We open the windows. Well, that's one of the problems when it does get hot. Nobody has air conditioning. Even the stores don't have air conditioning. Well, you know what has happened is that most buildings now, remember in office buildings, uh, if it was a hot day, you'd open up the windows and you get the draft. Now you can't. The draft would go through, but they build buildings now so you can't open windows because they don't want employees committing suicide. Mm. Yeah. So because of that, we now consume incredible amounts of air conditioning. Prior to the air conditioning thing, you know, 50s, you never thought about having an air conditioner. Not in San Francisco, at least. No, you just open the window. Yeah, and here in New York, like in this apartment, because it's an old building, I have flow-through air. I mean, I can open up the windows and get a nice circulation going. But most apartments, you can't do that now. What? Do you have, do you have air conditioning? Uh, I have air conditioners, you know, they're in the windows. Ah. Yeah, but that's it. You know, no, we don't have any central air conditioning. So anyway, a uh, 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 couple of things to talk about because this is our political wonk here. Oh. Yeah, a uh, guy, guy does political comedy for a living. <laughs> Give up your day job. Uh, so uh, we, we, this has got to have been a couple, good couple of weeks for you. You know? Just keeps moving. I mean, the guy, the, the, the Trump is the gift that keeps on giving. I write a column, and uh, I do a commentary 
And so I'll, I'll do uh, I'll record a commentary on Thursday because some radio stations run it on Friday morning. And then uh, that's uh, Thursday night, about 300 words, two minutes long. And then on Sunday, I turn that into a column. Yeah. And the column gets syndicated by a bunch of, uh, by a, a syndicator called Kegel Cartoons. So yeah, I get that to him on Monday. So I got Friday, Saturday, Sunday to revamp it. And I can't get it to him Saturday because all the papers decide all of, so just because of the, the deadlines and stuff, nobody's working Saturday or Sunday. So if I couldn't finish it on Friday in time so that they could run it on the weekend, so I just wait until Monday. But that gives me three extra days, and by the time I write the column, it's dead. It's yeah. dead. It's <laughs> old news. <laughs> <laughs> getting, he's been getting complaints from radio, from, from uh, newspapers that, well, uh, you know, uh, the State of the Union was uh, last Tuesday and this is Monday and now you're you're doing state of the U and so much shit has happened between then and now. <laughs> uh oh boy. Yeah. 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 I mean this week, you know, I wrote a I wrote a column this week and and then what happened? Um you had him go to to North Korea and then you had the testimony by Michael Cohen. So <laughs> you know, it was also yeah. Jeez almighty. Well it, for instance, uh it, we had the Michael Cohen testimony. Right, right. And and uh, now they're they're nitpicking his testimony. Oh he lied. What did he lie about? Well he said he never asked the president for a pardon. But it turns out his lawyers had made the approach to them saying would that be in the possibilities and the white house said no okay so was that michael cohn lying or was it just that his lawyers did something he didn't know about doesn't matter they'll say he's lying by saying oh you said you parked in uh, the spot next to the stairwell no that's a handicapped spot you you parked on the other side and there's an actual and so you lied to congress there. so you lied <laughs> yeah they just want to say that he lied that's all yeah, I mean, when you think about it, they're accusing him of lying. Uh, well, he's a convicted liar. Yeah, but what he lied about was to keep Donald Trump out of trouble. <laughs> so, so you're you're yelling at him for helping Donald Trump, yeah. and now he's telling the truth. I mean, if if hypocrisy were coal, these guys would be West Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just think that. Uh, I mean, uh, I, when I watch those hearings, not one Republican asked a question. No, no, they all just accused him. I mean, yeah, and, 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 and there's where did where did somebody write in a book somewhere? Oh, I forgot to turn on my little light here. Uh, 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 <laughs> where in the in the in in the book, does it say that Republicans have to be apologists for Trump? I mean, uh, the same book where it said Republicans had to be apologists for Nixon, because in the beginning, until until John Dean came along, yeah, and uh, they discovered about the tapes, and then everything was kind of over at that point. There was a hearing like this. Yeah, the same exact thing happened. Whether well, you had Republicans attacking the messenger. You know, they're killing the messenger instead of uh, yeah, uh, the yeah, guy with yeah. no clothes. But, I mean, it, 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 they, they seem to just be apologists. And when it came to this hearing, okay, one or two of you can say, hey, you're a liar, liar, pants on fire. But then ask some questions. And they didn't ask any questions. They just accused, accused, accused. And now it's back to the Democrats who then... You know, probably the only one who really was asking serious questions was uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Yeah, I thought she had interesting questions because they actually elicited new information, whereas everybody else was going over the old information. Yeah, I mean, she did her homework. You know, isn't it amazing how she has had an impact and she's only been in Congress for a little over a month? Yeah, but it's also interesting how the uh, the Minnesota Muslim female has been in trouble twice already, 
and everybody's scrambling, having to make up for her. If yeah. she went to a uh, Starbucks and they said, do you want a bagel? And she said no, they'd say she was anti-Semitic. <laughs> you know, I mean, th- come on. She is going to have an opinion about Israel. There's no question about it. I have an opinion about Israel, and it's much closer to hers than it is to, you know, uh, uh, Schumer's. You well, know, the first uh, time she got in trouble was she said, we're going to impeach the motherfucker. And I got no problem with I that. I got no problem with that. Uh, it, uh, you know. I, no oh, she said, she said, M, she said the MF word. Oh, fuck you. There's the FY word. How about that? Yeah, yeah, fuck you. So, I mean, uh, 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 you know, the, so they, they're going after her because she is Muslim and she has an opinion. I mean, I happen to... F- share some of the same opinions she has about Israel and about, you know, the way they've been treating the rest of their neighbors over the years. So you think it's all about the Benjamins? Oh, I think it's always about the Benjamins. You know, it, it's, it's actually an anti-Semitic concept that Jews are rich and that if we keep the Jews happy, we'll get money for our campaign. Make sense? Yeah. You know, and then they all of a sudden they find out the bet and Netanyahu's been stealing or doing something terrible. You know, what are the odds? What are the odds? Yeah, yeah. BB. You know how he got his name, don't you? BB. BB is it merger of uh, Netscape and Yahoo? <laughs> Netanyahu. <laughs> anyway, you knucklehead, get out! Get here. out of here! Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but uh, you know, I mean, it just it's. Um, so what happens? Yeah. yeah what I, I, happens? What, what, what do you think? What do you mean? Well, the the House uh, committee sent out eighty subpoenas, or you know, one documents from eighty different people yesterday. Oh, what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, they've got to tread carefully. I don't think they want to be uh, perceived as going after the president. But they want information that they've been denied in the past. Tax returns, things like that, you know, things that they should be able to have access to. And that's what they're, but they can't let themselves be perceived as being, you know, on the hunt for the president out to. So that's why they're trying to tamp down all talk of impeachment? Well, yeah, I think impeachment should be the last word you say. Okay, if you're going to be smart I, about this. I thing. don't even think, I think they're going to try to uh, beat him and kick him in the head until November 2020. I don't think they want to make him a martyr and pull him, pull him, uh, put him on a pedestal yeah. and point at him. I think yeah. they just want to tie him down yeah. and kick him in the head. What did you think about the Trump moment this week at uh, the, uh, what was that, CPAC? Uh, where well, two hour ran, ran well, but he started off by hugging the American flag. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Great. God bless it. You know, he doesn't even know how to be a conservative. <laughs> you know? he's, he's just a naked asshole, is what he is. You know, and he he has no shame, and he doesn't care who knows it. You well, know, I mean, nobody else would hug the American flag and and do that beatific kind of. You know, I mean, nobody, people would have shame, you know? They would think, oh, this is a cheap ploy. I don't want to be seen as doing this. He uh, doesn't care. There's nothing cheap enough for him. And then he gave a two-hour speech, and the only thing that that said to me and was reminiscent to me of is that's the kind of thing that, for instance, dictators do. Is it for, is it two, over yeah, a two-hour yeah, yeah. two and 20-minute speech? They got their people in front of them, and Fidel Castro will go on for five hours. Yeah, and- yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then he'll have people come and replace people standing in the audience like seat fillers at the Oscars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. You know, so th- that was the story with uh, with with Trump. It was like a, like a dictator giving one. Maduro does two-hour speeches, you know. Uh, and... and uh, um, they all they all tried to be funny at times. I mean, it's very dictator like. I don't know that Hitler gave speeches that long. Uh, I, I, I uh, my uh, World War Two history is kind of uh, uh, empty. I, I don't think they were two hours long because I think his speeches were well crafted. You know, they were crafted before he went out on stage. <coughs> uh, but uh, he reminds me of. You know, I'm a stand-up comic. I always wanted to be a stand-up comic. Yeah. And I always thought it was kind of a, 
uh, an art form to aspire to. And uh, I've always seen it uh, as the first refuge for people on the way down, you know, like yeah. soap opera stars and yeah. Joey, Joey Buttafuoco went on a stand-up comedy tour and Kate O'Kalen went on a stand-up <laughs> comedy tour. And now Stormy Daniels is, it gonna be is going out on a stand-up comedy tour. I don't know why. Why wouldn't she hang in the the stripper? Uh, for, all, all she has to do to make a lot of money is show her tits. Yeah. Or what are supposedly her tits. Now, <laughs> did her appeal go down at strip clubs that she's backing well, into? What would, what would you, you know, like, if, if it's you, like if you, the downside of fame and, and they're jonesing for one last fix to have that audience. Okay, but there. let me ask you this. Okay, you're a comic. You know what it takes to be a comic. You know what kind of money there is in being a comic. Uh, if you were a woman, would you make more money being a comic or a stripper? Uh, one has a long-term advantage. Yeah. You know, I mean... Well, it, not it, necessarily. Your not body is going to yeah. not uh, want to be reflected uh, by those Klieg lights. Uh, you're going to want... It's going to get drafty. <laughs> yeah, know? but but in, in, the, in the short fall, okay? Because, you know, comedy sometimes doesn't last that long either. How many people do you know came into comedy and no longer in it, right? Yeah. So so so, where would you make more money, being a stripper or being a stand-up comic? Just if you were the average stand-up comic, it depends on what depends on what kind of crowd you can get at both. Yeah, yeah, but on the average, let's say you're you're starting out in comedy. Well, she's not starting out; she's headlining. No, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. That, does that is that what it takes? Yeah. Yeah, is that what it takes? She, she she hasn't had to work her way up. She hasn't had to be an opening act, headline. you know. You know, it's like that poor kid, that fam. Remember when he won um, uh, Last Laugh or whatever that TV show was? I don't even know who that fam was. Yeah, he was the first winner, and and the poor kid uh, only had seven minutes, and now he's headlining. You know. And who's writing Stormy's material? I would like to help write Stormy's material. Oh God, you you should. Yeah. Because yeah. let's face I, it, what I, you what you gonna I, go up I, and make I, jokes I, about, right? Yeah. yeah. Got to make jokes about Trump. So you know. Um, and I have some good ones, and no one's hearing them. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you you can give her all the stuff you don't use. No, I can give her all the stuff I do use. It won't matter. <laughs> I don't think our audiences have have much, you know, intersection. But the problem is that once you yeah. give it to her, you can't use it anymore. Yeah. Uh, I remember Feldman was writing for Bill Maher, and I he, anything he wrote for Bill Maher for the TV show or for his personal act or whatever, uh, he couldn't use. It was now Bill Maher's, whether Bill used it or not. Yes, and that's the yeah. frustrating part. Is when you write a great line and then the, the guy you're writing it for doesn't like it and then you can't use it. Well, no, but do you <clears> sit there and do you say, gee, that's a good joke. I'll keep that for myself. Uh, yeah, well, you know. that's the problem with hiring comics as yeah. writers. <laughs> yeah. You should just have comic writers. So then we also had, you know, Trump was at CPAC. That gave us news. Yeah, yeah. We had uh, 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 the Cone. Okay, which is interesting. He has the same last name as uh, the other Cone, uh, uh, you know, Roy. Roy Cone, most but evil man I ever Roy met. Didn't have the E. It was too cheap for the E. Yeah, yeah. It was just C O H N. Roy Cone was the most evil man I've ever met. Oh, you met him? Oh, I debated him. I, when? He, Where? He, Why? I, I was oh, on the ooh. Barry Farber show, and he invited me over to just. To have a discussion with Roy Cohn. So I said, sure. And I go up and I meet this guy. He had eyes that were shark eyes. They were so, there was no life in those eyes. It was scary. It was like me. Somebody said this once. I, well, I said this and then I found out that somebody else said the same exact thing. He said, I never met the devil till I met Roy Cohn. Wow. I wow. felt I was meeting the devil. Wow. Uh, it, it, it was, it, and, and, uh, did he have a sense of humor? No, no, none whatsoever. And I said to him at one point, I said, you know, you're responsible for the death of uh, the Rosenbergs. 
And uh, I'm not going to go into the Rosenbergs. For those of you out there who don't know who the Rosenbergs were, but it was a big cause celebra, and they were executed. Apple and Julius. Yeah. And uh, he said, well, if I had a chance to do it again, I would. And he just looked at me with those shark eyes when he said it. And it just this, this chill went down my spine. He's, he said, if I had a chance to do it again, I would? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And without, he didn't even pause. It, it was the immediate reply to me. Uh, and that was, by the way, folks, that was Donald Trump's mentor. And he admits it. And he admits it. One of the most evil human beings alive. So evil, they did a whole play, Angels in America, about him dying. <laughs> you know. Uh, wow. And, and gay. And, and his, his precepts were never explain. Yeah. Never apologize, right? And constantly attack, right? And right. we see this, yeah. We see and this. also deny deny you're gay, while go sixteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. We see this, yeah. But deny you're gay. This is what he did all this. I mean, this is what Amer Angels in America is about. Was his denial of of his gayness, and then the fact that he was always putting down the gay community. He was always putting down gays. You know. Uh, he was yeah, a terrible. Was like, he was, was a like Jay Edgar. Ter terrible person. There goes your phone. Is that yeah, mine? Yeah. yeah. Uh, everybody always looks at their phone when they hear that sound. Is it me? Is it you? You know, because it's electronic, is what it is. Well, let's. Can we run over a little bit here? Because I just want I'm one in. one more one more snippet. I'm, in. I'm up. Yeah. He's up. Well, well, we'll do all night, okay? Because this goes on at night. Uh, Who had that show up all night? Up all night. Oh, that wasn't. No, who who was that? Rhonda Shear. Is that Rhonda Shear? I don't. I can't remember. Some woman. Yeah. But remember. and anyway, anyway, the other thing was his meeting with Kim Jong Un. It all this all happened in one week. Yeah. 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 Uh, he gets around. What what, did you, what 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 are your what are your takeaways from that? Well, it was still a win win because uh, he got to prove that he could walk away from a deal. And uh, Kim Jong Un got to go to Vietnam and eat food. You know, so was, <laughs> they both had a great photo op. I love how how you know, of course, Trump takes the plane, but Kim Jong Un took the train. Really? So, yes, he took a train from North, from from North, North Korea, Korea to Vietnam. Yeah, it took him two days, I think. No shit. That thing was traveling at thirty-five miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, really. He walked. <laughs> he could have walked faster. Uh, and then well, Trump. The great thing about Trump was, you know, it was a twenty-hour flight to North Korea, or to Vietnam, and then a twenty-hour flight back. So he was off Twitter during the whole Michael Cohen thing for two periods of of entire but, but, day. But can you know? he tweet from Air Force One? I mean, don't they have that capability? You yeah, he probably. Okay. I think. I think. In fact, I think he did actually. But anyway, uh, it, it, the whole Kim Jong Un thing. I feel that Kim Jong Un is the one who walked away. That he wasn't getting a deal. And uh, he just walked away because it, it, all of a sudden it went boom. It just crashed. It just stopped. You know. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll never know unless uh, one of the interpreters writes their memoirs yeah yeah because neither neither one of these guys will ever admit yeah to losing face or defeat so we'll never know yeah yeah we'll never know what happened the the best part about kim jong-un and this is the great game to play you know the old books where's waldo yeah yeah well it, it what you do is in any given photograph of kim jong-un at some reception or whatever you uh, you look for where's Kim Jong Un's sister? Now, oh really? Yeah, because the, it, the, there are certain photographs. The one who went to the where, Olympics. It, yeah, it, there are pictures of her like peeking around corners while he's somewhere, or being way back in the crowd. It's always like, where's find her in the photograph? Now she is the person. This is her job. She's the one that carries around the crystal ashtray. So when he smokes, she puts it out in front of him so he can drop the ashes in the crystal wow. ashtray. Wow. Well, she needs a lot more recognition for the, a job well done. 
<laughs> it reminds me of, uh, <clears throat> I, I can't remember which heavyweight champion it was, Evander Holyfield or, or the guy who kept hitting um, Randall Tex Cobb in the head, Larry Holmes. But uh, they, they had these huge retinues and yeah. contingents, and they only had one white guy on the entire contingent, and that was the guy to carry the spit bucket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you got to have the guy carrying the spit bucket. These these are jobs you don't want, okay? No, you know? no. Yeah. Larry Holmes, spit bucket carrier. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, as always, it is always a pleasure to do business with you, Mr. Hey, Shaw, Jones. the honor has been mine. Oh, Thank no, you. the honor is mine. Uh, no, I beg to differ. Oh, kind of. nay, nay, sir. <laughs> Pasha. Pasha. We no, can do no, a thousand times. We no. can do this all day, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and uh, would be make for some it's boring very hush, broadcasting. Hush, hey, listen, uh, talk to you in about three weeks again, huh? Hope to. Yeah. Hope in the meantime, to. stay safe, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. That's Will Durst. Bye, Will. Bye, Alex. <laughs> Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. And that's our good friend, Will Durst. Thank you so much, Will, for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, okay? All righty, let, uh, let me see here. We've got to open up the Skype lines here. I have to, every Monday, I have to remember how I do everything here. Uh, let me see here. There we go. And I'll open the lines. There we go. It's open. Uh, let me clean up a few things here that I got to do. Uh, just in, not stuff that you should be bothered by. Uh, our, uh, our Skype lines are open and our Skype line is, in case you were wondering, um, our Skype line is, uh, um, Gabnet Live. That's our ID. Here comes Jeff immediately first, right out of the right out of the box, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, our old friend, uh, and there he is, Jeff Stein. And also calling now is uh, Charlie Wallace, who's joining us. Uh, so we have uh, we have a panel of two now. Now, now remember, everybody, it's a fill free couple of weeks, I guess, is is what the what the what we've been told. <laughs> He, he he's out. Uh, somebody got there. Somebody got their uh, their thing on. I think you, uh, Charlie. Charlie. Uh, do I have what? Some audio slapping back on me, and I think it's coming from you. Well, no. seems to be gone now. Yeah. Okay. We're fine. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> you know. Uh. Uh. But uh, anyway. Uh. Let me see here. Let me let me get the, 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 the panel. Here we go. There we go. I want to put up my little logo here so that you... What was that? Again. I just plugged in. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Anyway, there's Charlie and there's Jeff. And I was saying that Phil is not going to be here for a couple of weeks. He's out being eaten by sharks. So uh, it's a, you, you can call and, uh, and, and not worry about being able to breathe for space here. Hello, Rob Alfano. Turn up your mic. I can't hear you. Oh. What? You, really? You can't even hear you hardly. What? Is something not plugged in? It's plugged in. How about that? A little more. A little more. A little more. How about that? That's better. Uh, That's okay. much better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How you doing, Rob? Good. good. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, we were in Florida over the weekend. What were you doing in Florida? Uh, went to a baseball game mm -hmm. and a party. Baseball. So we left Thursday and came back Sunday. Whose baseball game? Yankee game. Yankee game. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Of course, you're a big Yankee fan, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> was, this, was this spring training, right? Yeah. Yeah. And who were they playing? Baltimore. Baltimore. Okay. So mm -hmm. it was uh, was it a good game? Did you have a good time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Well, well, I've never been down to spring training before, so. Well, now mm -hmm. you're you're one of two people I know is going to spring training because I just talked to Will Durst and he's going to spring day, uh, spring training in Scottsdale to go see the Giants mm -hmm. in spring training. Oh, there you go. 
And uh, how much does it cost to get to it? And you were saying, Charlie, that it was 80 bucks, and Durst agreed with you. Okay. Yeah, it's, about, it's, it's about right. About right? Yeah. Now, what does it cost? I had, I had one, we were one row behind the Yankee dugout. So there were $900 seats at Yankee Stadium. Oh, okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Is that what they would be at Yankee? $69 a ticket. Because um, um, what, what's the cheapest ticket you can get into a ball game for here in New York? I think about twenty dollars. Really? And where's that? Up? Uh, you get a nosebleed up there? Yeah. You, way you're up sitting top. next to a guy's flying the night mail to St. Louis. Yeah, and I th and maybe the bleacher seats are a little cheaper. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There's not as many bleachers as, as there used to be. Yeah. Now, yeah. when you say bleachers, see, I'm, I, I don't mind baseball. I like baseball as a game. I don't follow it, and I'm not really particularly up on the nomenclature of baseball. Uh, but I love baseball stories, baseball movies, baseball documentaries. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I like occasionally going to a baseball game because it's a very social occasion with your friends. Mm -hmm. And what do you do out there? You get some sun. Nothing much happens, right? <laughs> Nothing much happens. Uh, so, and, and, and in the meantime... People are sending hot dogs your way and beer right. your way, and in my case, soda my way. Right. And you're talking with your friends about the world around you and how have you been, how's the wife and kids, and then all of a sudden, something happens. Wow, That's something right. happened. And then, <laughs> then it's back to waiting for something to happen again. Right? Yeah. But, yeah. but all in all, I consider it, one of the greatest American pastimes because it's a very sociable occasion. Even with people you don't know might be sitting next to you. Everybody's very friendly and very amiable to each other. And uh, it's just everybody got together to watch this thing happening out in the pasture. Yeah. And like in my case, the weather was, it was 80 degrees and beautiful weather. It was just nice. gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was an evening game, 630 start. Yeah. So you, you weren't fried in the sun, and it was great. Well, Marjorie and I have talked about getting out, out of New York, um, but we can't find the exit. <laughs> we, actually, we actually drove. You actually I drove. drove? Oh, wow. I drove like 19 yeah. hours straight Thursday. I left at 6 in the morning and got there at 9.30 at night. Wow. And how many days did you stay there? Well, we were going to stay until Sunday morning, mm -hmm. but there was – some threat of eight inches of snow back here. Yeah. So we left Saturday. So how long were uh, you there? We got there Thursday night and we left Saturday at about 7 p.m. And I drove straight through to nine o'clock Sunday morning. So, we were home. so between the two trips, you did about 40 hours of driving. To stay Close. to stay there for about forty hours. That's <laughs> yeah, that's about right. <laughs> wow. You know, if I'm going to drive that far, I'm going to stay there for quite a while. It was a test because I hate flying. Yeah. And I've been talking about, and I have to go to Orlando a lot for work. And so I've been threatening that I was going to drive there. Yeah. But I've learned that I probably won't do that. You no, know, no. It's, it's too much. No. Um, it's, it really is. But you know what I'm thinking about doing is the auto train. I could drive about an hour to get to Lorton, Virginia. Yeah. Get on the auto train with my car. Yeah. And that takes you or straight to Orlando. Wow. Really? And how much does it cost to put your car on the auto train? I haven't researched that yet. You know, I mean, uh, it it can't be cheap. Uh, well, think about what it would cost you to rent a car while you're there. Yeah. Okay, and what gas would cost to get you down there if you drove? Yeah. I did, and I drove my Corvette down, and it cost uh, at forty some odd dollars each fill up. What did I do? Four fill ups each way. Yeah. Each way you did four fill ups. Oh, I think God. so, three to four. God, I, you know, I was watching an old movie, some old movie from the forties, where a guy pulls into a gas station, and the sign says fifteen cents. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I'm going, those were the days. Yeah. You know? But you know what's interesting is there wasn't one toll between here and there. 
Yeah, no more. Yeah. No tolls on 95. Yeah. It's like that, that vein that goes through the penis that's known as Florida. <laughs> that's the way it always looked to me. I mean, Florida looked like a giant penis with a vein, uh, I-95, <laughs> going down the middle of it, okay? And then when you get to the bottom of the penis, the tip of the penis, you've got these jets of sperm coming out. <laughs> Called the uh, called the uh, Florida Keys, and I, I used to call them the Florida Jizz. You know, I mean, it, it's just it, really the whole thing is a giant penis. Yeah. <laughs> I think you ought to see a psychologist about this. <laughs> no, I needed to see a psychologist after living in that giant penis. Okay. <laughs> And when I would say this on the air, not exactly as I'm saying it now, but implying it, uh, I would get death threats, literally, <laughs> because I got to hate Florida very fast. I'll tell you, that weather was so spectacular. Yeah. And My that, God. And that's nice. And then you get the fuck out of there. Don't stay there. Don't live there. Don't say this is a good life because it's not. When you retire? I don't know. I wouldn't. If I were you, you're living in the most expensive place. It yeah. well, I, who said I want? Who said I wanted to live here? It's my huh? crazy wife that wants to live here. Ah, there's no way. Me and you're living in the cold. Listen, I was talking I, I, in a couple of days. Uh, I'm going to have an interview. Maybe tomorrow night. Maybe the night afterwards. I already did it with uh, this guy. He's 92 years old now, named Ted Randall, who's one of the first top 40 disc jockeys I ever heard in my life. Okay. He, and he was the first radio consultant ever, okay? First guy to do radio consultancy. And he's 92 now. And he lives in Victoria, Canada, British Columbia. And uh, I said to him, so uh, how do you like the, uh, the health plan up there? He says, I'm 92. He says, I've had this problem, I've had that problem. He said, if I were in the United States and never left, I'd be dead by now. <laughs> that's how good the medical system is up here yeah yeah so i i went well maybe i should move to canada you know or maybe i should i i, I would love to move to the country somewhere i just love country you know uh i could see living in vermont for instance but then the winter comes and you're up to oh. your pupic and snow you know yeah, that's crazy pupic is a term i'm using for jeff's certification thank you <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Jeff and I and his lovely wife, Pamela, and uh, somebody else. Oh, my Mar Mar Marjorie. Uh, yeah, Marjorie. Uh, Marjorie uh, came to, went to lunch. We all went out to lunch the other day. Uh, and uh, I, 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 you, you guys are great, by the way. We just enjoyed ourselves all to hell. Um, yeah, we had a good time. You know, and uh, uh, we went to a place called the Milling Room. It's good. The food's very good there, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, you know, you you go into restaurants and they all look the same. Yeah. This place, it was architecturally different. It, Apparently, it, it had been a different. Uh, it was a hotel uh, at one time. A hotel. Yeah, and, and this was like of it this was, was like the lobby, I think, or something like that. Yeah, and it, it was quite interesting, mm -hmm. and uh, and the food was good, and the people were nice. Everything was, and we had a great time. Yeah. So, so that's the most I've gotten out of the house in months. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, I, uh, I, I, I really, you know, I mean, uh, we haven't been on a vacation since we got married, to tell you the truth, you know, and we really think we should, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's about time, you know, you guys can get along without me for a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. How about a couple of months? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we got to get out of here. Just got to do it because uh, I New York City, I have no love for anymore. You know, when I first came to New York when I was, what, 30, 29, 30, I had a love affair with this city. Yeah. And this was the kind of city that at that time people could never understand a love affair with this city because it was dirty. It was dangerous. <laughs> uh, it was everything. And it was wonderful. There was just something just vibrant about it. Now, have you, have you uh, uh, I don't know if you've done this, Rob uh, or Jeff, but have you gone to Times Square lately? Yeah. Not, I mean, not in the last eight months or a year, but oh, it's like it's, but it's Toontown. It's terrible. 
It's in the town. I haven't, I haven't been to Times Square. Huh? You haven't? Long time. Oh, well, go Just down, been there in go a long down time. there, uh, uh, Jeff. You will be absolutely surprised because it used no to, character. you know, I used to stand in Times Square and I used to look up at the, the lights, not the LED screens, but the lights of Broadway. Right. And I would say, I'm in the center of the universe here. You know, the universe starts right here and radiates out of Times Square. And uh, yeah, sure, you got down to 42nd Street and there were porno theaters and there were hookers and there were, mm -hmm. it was, but there was something about that that was vibrant. It was alive. It, it you know, and in spite real. of, huh? It was real. It was real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now it's all fake. And now it's all fake. And Plastic. what comes with all the fakeness? The tourists. You know, and uh, you can't even walk through there. It's just this human traffic jam. The cars are moving faster than the people are because the streets are easier to, you know. And, and by the way, they've done all that's one lane now through Broadway. Remember how it was like three lanes or something like that? Now it's one lane. The rest of it are places where people can sit outside and eat. Yeah. Oh. That's New York. I, I'm supposed to love that, you know. Well, you don't have to go there. Yeah, I'm up here in Harlem. And Harlem had a lot of flavor when we first got here, but now it's gentrifying, so it looks like every other neighborhood in New York City. Uh, so, anyway. So we, we had some crime in our neighborhood today. There was some problem with a cop shooting some people or something, and they had a helicopter from the TV station flying over the street, hovering over the street. We were watching it on TV. We look out the window. There's the helicopter, you know. But that's the most that's happened in our neighborhood. You know, the first year we moved in, there were a couple of murders, and that was it. And then it, it gentrified, you know. Do you feel danger in danger when you come to my neighborhood, uh, Jeff? No. No. Nah. You know. No, not at all. Yeah. There used to be a time you wouldn't even come into this neighborhood. Well, that's true, but you know, I used to go there when I was like five years old because my grandma and, and grandpa owned a, a building there and lived there. Yeah, but you see, that there was a time when this neighborhood wasn't dangerous. It was just black, basically. It was black. You know, yeah. but it wasn't dangerous. I mean, that's, it, that's true. It, you know, and then it went through that period of being dangerous, like in the in the late 60s 70s 80s it was yeah. you know yeah. and this building was like one giant crack house i mean what they portrayed it as in new jack city is exactly what it was you oh, know yeah. but uh okay. uh it, I, I remember walking down the street and next thing i know there's somebody else has got their hands in my pants trying to get some money out of my pocket. It turned out it was Michael Jackson. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be here all week. By the way, anybody watch that thing? No. Well, I did. Uh, here's why I watched it, because Marjorie wanted to watch it. Okay? And I kind of felt guilty watching it. Because there was just something that wasn't right about it. Now, you know, maybe their story is true. I don't know. You know? They don't... They don't give any proof that these people are telling the truth, you know, uh, because all the people around them, like people like Macaulay Culkin says, I never saw any of that going on. He never molested me. And, uh, you know, at this point in his life, it wouldn't hurt M Macaulay Culkin to come forward if it were true. But, the, you know, very few people came through with these allegations except for these two guys and the guy that, that sued, you know, went, took Michael Jackson to court. And by the way, these two people in his court trial when they were kids, younger, testified on Michael Jackson's behalf. So, you know, so you wonder how much of it is true and how much of, how much of it is not true. And if it is all true, is it, the guy isn't alive. It's not fair. He, he can't defend himself. And his family, who claim, well, we were never interviewed, probably never should have been interviewed because they were not witnesses to this. No, they okay. don't know him that well, really, yeah. if you think about it. So what are you doing? You're beating up on a guy who's 
probably not going to take legal action against you. The family is, but they're never going to even come close to getting a hundred million dollars yeah. out of HBO. I mean, HBO will just stonewall them, and and most courts will say, look. This is a documentary. The main thrust of it was what happens when kids are molested and how do they turn out and what is the grief they go through and so on and so forth. And I think HBO will walk away, skate away from that clear. Uh, but if Michael Jackson were alive, he could take action against him. And if Michael Jackson were alive, they wouldn't have done the documentary. Why? Mm -hmm. Huh? Why? 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 Because they'd know they could get sued by Michael Jackson. They can't be sued by his estate, huh? Well, they can no, they can be sued by his estate, but there's a lot it's a lot more difficult to get anything out of it. You know? A, a live person who's you know okay. Uh what's his name? The guy they just got, uh R. Kelly. Uh did you any see that documentary? Yes. That was riveting, I will have to say. Uh and the effect of that documentary is that the guy has been uh, call to account for a lot of stuff, but he's alive. He can defend himself. And so if he doesn't like what was on that documentary, he had every right probably to be in that documentary and to deny it. All right. So there's that ability. So in that respect, I thought it was an honest documentary. Plus there was so much unrefu irrefutable uh, uh, facts in that thing that that you didn't think it was all just rumor and storytelling by people but this i felt hey he's been dead what he died in 1999 something like that am i wrong I have no uh, idea it was quite a while ago yeah you know and uh you know if the story's true i feel sorry for these kids if it's not true i feel sorry for michael jackson and even if I feel sorry for them, I, and it is true, I still feel sorry for Michael Jackson because he grew up f because people around him fucked him up, okay? Right. The father fucked him up. The whole showbiz thing fucked him up. He grew I grew up uh, pretty fucked up, you know? So what else can I say but that? Uh, but I felt guilt. I kind of felt guilty watching it. I kind of wanted to go take a shower when I was through. You know, <laughs> I'm not, I just said I feel guilty. It's like I'm, 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 I'm looking at them assailing a guy who can't defend himself. You know, and I, I, these kids may well have gone through this, and if they did, it was terrible. It was terrible of Michael to do it, but nevertheless. Uh, it's it it you know it it, it 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 was just something wrong about the way in which it was done and uh, if uh, if he were alive they wouldn't do the documentary right now because they oh no we'll get sued by Michael Jackson we can't do this you know I think very they were very brave to do the R Kelly thing because he is alive and he has a lot of money and he can do a lot of suing. And uh, but the proof in this in the pudding that I don't think he has even filed any kind of action against yeah. uh, who was it a and e or whoever it was that ran the r kelly documentary so uh it's uh it's you know it, it's kind of interesting but th th that was the big thing this weekend was the uh leaving neverland oh and then oprah did an hour with the two guys interviewing them and she's being assailed for that <clears throat> a lot she's of she's a big michael supporter she was yeah but in this doc, in this uh, interview, she comes out playing the game with these guys. So you know, uh, yeah, it's it's really strange. It's really strange. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes there's one other thing: when people die, uh, some people die, and the reaction to their death is not what you think it would be. Uh, and uh, what's his name? The guy from uh, uh, 90210, uh, Beverly yeah. Hills 90210. Uh, oh, what's his name? How's my mind? Um, Priestley, Luke Jason. Perry. Huh? Will, Luke Perry. Luke, Luke Perry. Perry. Uh, I watch him every week on Riverdale. Uh, he plays Archie's father. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and yet I never thought much about him. I mean, I was never, you know, a big... Uh, uh, a major fan of nine. I wasn't a fan of nine Oh two one Oh, that was for damn sure. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, more than that, I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't the big on 90210. Uh, but nevertheless, isn't it amazing the amount of, of uh, coverage his death has gotten? So his impact on the uh, on America was larger than we ever thought it was. You know, was that because of him, or was that just because it happened to be the appropriate time? Well, I mean, it, it's some TV time. You know, if we're, it, if somebody more important had died in the last couple of days, he probably would have been pushed off the front page. But all I'm saying is. A lot of times people die and you don't think, hey, they're just going to mention it and that's it and we're on, on with stuff. And then all of a sudden you realize that everybody's like mourning the death of this person. you know. And I think, I think it has a lot to do with people mourning the passing of time. Yeah, hey, I'm I mean, just getting so a little bit older. If Luke Perry <clears throat> has died and when I was a teenager, I, he, was, she was a heart, he was a heartthrob for me. Okay? Uh... uh uh, I, uh, uh, time, I'm getting older too. I feel sad that I'm older. Could that yeah, be it? Absolutely. absolutely. I'm trying to think of who this happened to recently that died and everybody was just mourning them like crazy. And you went, did you ever think, uh, I, I remember when Leonard, Leonard Neboy died, there was a lot of just news about it and people talking about it. And I think, again, that was another one of those cases of, hey, Leonard Nimoy died. That means I'm getting closer to the grave. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but it's true. Mm hmm. You know? Um, but, oh, here, Did comes, I Tom, tell you the, here comes Tommy Amaguchi. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Tommy Amaguchi. Tommy Amaguchi sees that the coast is clear. Hi, Tom. How are you? The coast is clear. Uh, happy uh, happy uh, Shrove Tuesday. Oh yes, this is uh, this is uh, Fat Tuesday. This is uh, yeah. the uh, day before Lent. Uh, gee, I have to start fasting tomorrow. Oh no, I don't. I'm Jewish. Uh, let me forget about that then. I had it down on the calendar. Start fasting, and now I don't have to. <laughs> so I decided to put on my father's Mardi Gras shirt. Oh really? That's very festive. Uh, it that, is. That That's actually cool. looks like a soccer shirt. Is what it looks like. Yeah. For well, some some for uh, colors, I know some Irish gay oh. team. I think uh, for the colors. <laughs> well, he was Irish. <laughs> yeah, uh, I remember once I wore a soccer. I had a soccer a soccer shirt. It was blue and white, and I wore it to the uh, second level of the uh, of the Eiffel Tower and sat in the restaurant, and nobody would serve me because my soccer shirt was the color of an opposing team. Oh. That's how the French are, those fucks. You know. So. Uh, by the way, uh, Michael Jackson died in 2009. Okay, so I'm 10 years off. 2009, hey. folks, I'm sorry. <laughs> 10 years ago instead of nine years Yeah, ago. why did I think it was 2000? Why did I think it was 1999? Oh, well. well, that's a long time. Uh, you know, I, I'm losing all track of time. Uh, I was trying to put things together, like when I was going to talk to this uh, this uh, uh, jock, uh, Ted Randall. Uh, mm -hmm. I was I was trying to remember when I went to KLAD in Klamath Falls and things like that, and I and and the dates started eluding me. Hello, Ray Renati. He's there, getting healthy. Hello. He's getting healthy. Uh, I, I trying to put things together, you know, in some Just trying kind to get of, kicked out of the YMCA. Yeah. Uh, what? You're trying to get kicked out of the YMCA? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I, you know, I was a member of the YWCA. Now oh, you, really? Yeah. Oh. You, well, that was a better place to be in the two, so far as I was concerned. <laughs> no, but what it was is I got made a, a member of the YWCA because I... I was a camp counselor for the YWCA. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, yes, folks, I was a camp counselor, if you can imagine that. And uh, they so in order to be oh a God. camp counselor, I had to be a member of the YWCA. So they made me a, a, a I don't know, honorary member or something of the YWCA. So that, that yeah. 
Uh, your your picture is freezing up every now and then, Ray. I think uh, I think the YMCA is out I'm, to get you. I probably have a bad connection. Yeah, they're out to get you. Yeah, that's yeah. like Yogi Yogi Bear charge at the picnic baskets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So listen, uh, one of the more pervasive uh, 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 videos this week, and one of the ones I think I loved more than any other, was uh, the picture of Donald Trump hugging the flag. Oh, God. <laughs> what, did that, what did that man think he was doing? You know? And is that in its own yeah, way it's... disrespecting the American flag? Right. Huh? What were you going to say, Jeff? Isn't there a certain rule... That if a flag gets dirty, yeah, you're not supposed to clean it. You you got to burn it. You burn it. Yes, yeah. Well, well old flags, if, that, old flags. That, when you dispose that, of an American that in charge of that flag, yeah, that had Trump hanging all over it. Yeah, yeah, and, and probably it today. And, and probably it's got orange his, all over it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> orange all over it. Uh, uh, I, 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 the thing is that you are supposed to the proper thing to do is when you're when a flag is tattered and no longer usable you don't throw it in the garbage can you don't put it in the shredder you burn it that's what you do with it that's It'll why when everybody was burning the american flag i was going but that's what you do with the american flag <laughs> that's how you get rid of them i mean i think it's silly you should be able to throw it in the garbage but you don't you know why can't you just throw it in the washer? Either that, or you turn it into a shirt for uh, for for uh, 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 Tom here. Tom. You know, <laughs> I just cut it up and use it to wash my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 I, I use it to wax. You know, I don't know. I've, I have I ever owned an American flag? I don't think so. You know, I don't think I ever have. I have so. a Texas flag. Hmm. I have a Texas flag. Really? Why? I retired from the comptroller's office. They gave me a flag of Texas that was hanging over the Capitol the day I retired. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. How nice. That, I mean, that's nice that they did that. The flag was flying <laughs> that day over the Texas Tower. And now the flag is here. Now, suppose two of you retired on the same day. Um. Well, let me let me amend that. I think it all it was was a flag that had flown over the. Oh, Texas okay, Trump. okay. Because you're right, there could have been more than one person retiring on June 29, 2000. Also, they would have had to take the flag down and put another one up. And once yeah. that one was up, they probably have to take that one down to give to you, and then when and put another one up. But once they got that one down, they'd have to take that one down to give to you. But then once they gave it to you, they'd ha you get what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> None of that works. Yes, Tom. Actually, that's what they do at the uh, U.S. Capitol. They they have uh, requests from constituents for a flag to flow over the Capitol. So there's like this full-time person running up flags for just a brief moment, yeah. bringing them down, and they, they, they fold them up and they send them to people. Really? Yes, really. So, in, in the United States Capitol? Or? The U.S. Capitol, yes. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. That's incredible. But anyway, so um, here you've got Donald Trump giving a speech to CPAC uh, that is two hours and two minutes long. The longest speech he's ever given. Uh, and I started to think about it, and I went, who do I know also that's a world leader that gives speeches that long? And I came up with names like Castro, Maduro, uh, who, uh, who was the guy before, Chavez, um, uh, Hitler. Hitler, yeah. I think, used to give two-hour speeches. Only dictators give two-hour speeches. Yeah. Tom. Chavez had that TV show where he would be uh, he would be on all day long, and people were sort of required to watch it if they were in the party. Oh. <laughs> and it was like a variety show that starred him. Yeah, yeah. You ever see that? The, what, what, which show is it? Who is that? Who is that? Chavez. 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 Yeah, you yeah. It was, Chavez. I'm sure. I, I'm. Yeah. I'm surprised he didn't have the Chavez dancing girls and stuff. You know. The, he had all that stuff. He did. He the Chavettes. And he would tell jokes and stories, and it would go on for hours. Yeah. 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 Yes, Tom. 
you know, say that actually I don't consider that a speech. It just he he does monologues. Yeah, he that, goes up and he gives little performances, and it's, it's like just a like one man act. Well, I, I'll tell you what, what, Tom, you're you're insulting comedy acts for for, for, for starters. <laughs> well, I said it was good, and you're also and, you're, you're, and if you're not insulting comedy acts, you're insulting one man shows. Yeah, you know? I mean, he wants to be a one man show. I mean, you know, that's that's basically his stick. He thinks he's funny. He's he's he does the these these monologues and and for the people that. That for his his cult, they love it. They eat it all up. Yep. You know. Now the people who were in that room were they sticking around, or was any of them leaving? Were they getting they loved tired? It. Of they loved it. They so loved it. Word was that, that 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 people started leaving, and that's why he said that the people didn't leave. <laughs> wow! I heard they loved it. You you heard they loved it. Where'd you hear they yeah, loved heard, it? Oh, on the on the news, I heard that uh, he was he riveted the crowd. <laughs> I heard he was almost incoherent. Well, absolutely, but they love that. Well, no, we're we're getting into that point where it's the ramblings of a madman. You know. Getting? <laughs> getting. Well, I'm I'm being nice here. We're talking about the campaign. When he was rambling. <laughs> Oh, boy. I, I just don't understand why anybody thinks this guy is a good idea. In fact, I don't understand how Republicans in general can can, can even countenance this guy being the, the head of his party. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see here. I think Jeff had his hand up first and then uh, Tom. Yes, Jeff. Yeah. Maybe we have the same thing. Probably. I think the Republicans are afraid of him. Mm hmm you really do. What what can he do to them? Primary him. Well, no, uh, primaries are over. Okay, we've the only, next time there's anything close to a primary, there's anything close to elections locally for these guys is probably. I would say it's two, 2020. Uh, primary, yeah. You know, primary I think what the, I think what they're worried about is their constituency. Yeah. You know. Um, Today he came out with a tweet saying, 90, it's, survey said that 95% of Republicans approve of me, which is not true. Was, I, the number I saw was in the 60s somewhere, you know. But he's, he's passing these, uh, you know, these rumors around, so that's our boy. Yeah, uh, here comes Josh Wheeler. Hello, Josh. Hello. Yeah, uh, did you hear about this 95% approval rating for... for uh, <laughs> Um, uh, Trump among Republi uh, among Republicans. Yeah. That, is that among Republicans or yeah, something? Yeah, supposedly. Yeah. yeah, that's that doesn't surprise me. You think you think it's ninety five percent? I don't think so. I think I heard it being far less than that. Yes, Tom. Yeah, it's probably that, but it also kept remembering that the the the, the percentage of of uh, of Republicans as far as the uh, electorate goes is just constantly it has been declining. Yeah. I mean, there's only about maybe a third, 30, 36 percent of, of the people who are registered are, are registered Republicans. But just getting back to what to what uh, Jeff was saying. Uh, yeah, they're they're definitely afraid of being primary. And there's always an election coming up around the corner. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're definitely afraid of that. But I would also add the fact is. They love him because he's he's given them the goodies they want. I mean, he's given them their big tax break, and even more than that, he's giving them court justices. Yeah. He's given them two Supreme Court justices right now. They love it for that. They don't care if, if if he can't get his agenda through Congress. They'll just give him that. Now we'll see what happens with this with this vote on the uh, resolution uh, uh, to stop his uh, emergency, you know, his emergency declaration. Yeah. Uh, word up here is that uh, Rand Paul says he's got ten Republican votes on his side. So that's that's pretty significant if that actually happens. Ten Republican votes on his side. Where in the uh, in the Senate? Against uh, uh, with the Democrats. So siding siding with the Democrats. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it, I think the Senate already voted, didn't they? No. House voted. But somebody said that uh, the Senate was leaning towards denying the emergency you know right right i mean 
what's happened is they they need something like four votes and they've got three or four votes they've got the, the those votes yeah but it looks like they might have more now they don't have enough to override a veto mm -hmm. that's the thing they they can't he'll he'll veto it and it'll go back and and and, and they won't be able to ride it but the fact that he's, they've got if they get as many votes as as that that's going to be a significant. Well, if, it, if he vetoes there. it, I think we can, they can take it to the Supreme Court, can't they? Yeah, I'm sure it's going to the Supreme Court anyway. Yeah, yeah. And and how's he going to win when somebody says even the president himself says, "Well, really, he didn't need to do it." Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, he said that. Yep. He yep. Did. You know, and and I think even the even the most conservative justice justice would say, "Well, if he didn't need it, why'd you do it?" <laughs> right, you know yeah. what? And here, state of emergency, and then he goes and plays golf. Well, you yeah. know what? He wastes our time a lot. Like, oh. remember all the troops he sent down to the border? How much did that wind up costing us? Yeah. And what did it serve? Nothing. Yeah, now he's going to do this. Political. He went to he went to uh, he went to Hanoi, which at least finally he went to Vietnam. Uh, he went to Hanoi. And came back with absolutely nothing. And nothing happened there either. They had lunch, basically, and that was it. Well, you know, and, and how much money did that cost us? Just in the gas for Air Force One alone. Yes, Tom. Well, and also while they were there, they found out that, uh, that the North Koreans were actually had created another underground uh, Nuclear facility. Uh, yes, as a matter <laughs> of fact, I, that, I that, that, things pretty much too. <laughs> that came yeah. out today. No, that came out today. They aren't doing it underground. They actually have pictures now of them moving stuff into 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 place to shoot up some more rockets. And they think he's going to do that to you know say to Trump, "Fuck you," mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but uh, he, he, they say he's getting ready to shoot some more missiles. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know, they keep saying, well, yeah, he can shoot a missile and he's capable of hitting the west coast of the United States. And you go, ooh, that's scary. The fact is, though, it'll never get there because before it even gets here, it's going to be shot out of the skies. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, we can defend ourselves against some kind of puny missile he's sending over here. Uh, hopefully. 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 I think we, you know, I'm not, I'm not that worried about it. So, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, so, uh, it's, uh, we, yes, Ray. Well, I think the problem is, though, then it puts us in a position of, of okay, do we retaliate? Do we not retaliate? It gets it. It puts us in a really bad position, even if we're able to shoot it out of the sky. You know. Well, you got to shoot it out of the sky if it's coming towards you. No. You know. No, no. Of course, you have to shoot out of the sky, but then, then we have to make the decision: do we leave it at that? Then what do we do? You know, do we sh do we sh shoot one at them? That's what would have I mean, to that's happen. That's the problem. Yeah, see, that's the scary thing. Then you got World War Three on your hands. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't think you, you got know, World War Three. Maybe III. not. You don't have World War Three on your hands because he doesn't have enough missiles to fight with us. Yeah, yeah. but other countries. No, not his, not him. But other countries would get involved. No, but I don't think other countries. If we just shot, if we shot down the missile, which we're capable of doing in midair, we're not shooting it over North, North Korea or anything like that. We're just simply shooting down the missile. And I don't think anybody would blame us for that, even, <laughs> even the, you know, Russia or China or anybody else. I don't know about that. But, but people might attack North Korea, and then China would have to get involved and defend North Korea. <laughs> well, yes, anyway. yes. That's why we're never going to go attack North Korea, unless North Korea attacks us, and then it's provoked, you know. The, the only problem with a small country like North Korea is you got a, a tin horn leader who thinks he's really bigger than he than he is, although he's quite large, uh, uh, bigger than he is, uh, who then uh, will do something really stupid believing that and then cause some kind of situation in which we got to defend ourselves or we've got to go in and attack them. And then we got China attacking. It could could start a world conflict but because this guy is like doesn't know where he's at you know 
and uh, it's it's it, that's where he's dangerous. Uh, but I think that if he tried to shoot a missile towards us and it was coming towards us and we shot it down, I don't think anybody would blame us for shooting it down. No. You know, it's a perfectly reasonable response. Not but shooting it down, but... Us to retaliate. No, if we retaliated retaliate. by shooting a missile at North Korea, then we would have problems. But if all we were doing was shooting down the missile and then saying to the world, look, he tried to shoot a missile at us, well, then you've got China on his ass, and you've got a whole bunch of other people on his ass, and they're they're not going to put up with that, you know. I mean, I I don't think China's a yes man for North Korea, but they're an, they become an apologist for them, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. what do you think? Uh, what do you what do you, what do you think, uh, Josh? <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I. I think, we, you know, I don't think we'd be in any trouble if we uh, took steps to defend against an incoming uh, attack. But I, I just think what everyone would be, they're probably correct. What they'd be worried about is what happens after that. I mean, uh, you know, if North Korea decided to invade South Korea, for example, or, or whatever, uh, right after, or use a lot of his short-term ballistic missiles that he's believed to have or pretty much known to have, uh, that don't, don't necessarily carry uh, nuclear warheads or warheads over a long period, but certainly uh, short enough to get them into South Korea, could kill a lot of South Koreans yeah. um, who were pledged to defend. And not just South Koreans, but, you know, I mean, there are other people in the region he could attack too. But I think that would probably be the main worry. Uh, but, but I think everybody's right. I mean, well, what Trump does is when he puts things on such a, such a bad footing uh you know just he doesn't help anything i think we all know that it just agitates the the situation i mean yeah you know he's not he's, he's not any kind of a peacemaker a deal maker i mean uh, come on no one believes that anymore that was all you know made for tv you know bullshit i mean uh see I'm, and I'm, i think I'm, a lot of know. people do believe that though uh, uh, yeah yeah you, you know that's that's i guess among us, I suppose. So yeah, you're right. That's that's not a good statement. I mean, uh, that's the problem, though. I mean, is the fact that you are right. There are a lot of people who probably still believe that, you know, outside of a group like this. I mean, and that's that's what allowed that to happen. Well, you, you know? know, he and, said he said that he walked away from the deal, and even a lot of Democrats have lauded him for that, saying they fully expected he would make any deal that had to be made. My feeling is he didn't walk away from the deal. Kim Jong-un walked away from the deal. Yes. And then he came back and in true Trump fashion said, well, Kim Jong-un walked away from the deal. Yes, Tom. I was saying, actually what the Democrats were saying is they were relieved because they were afraid he was going to give away the store. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is making the best of an otherwise terrible situation. Yeah. But the one thing also that you have to keep in mind is for this has been a big boost for for Kim Jong Un. I mean, just the fact that that he's gotten this platform with the you know with the most powerful person in in the world has boosted him. So he's yeah. he's he's happy to 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 uh, to to get this boost to take back uh, to his country. So I mean, Trump has just handed this to him, and. And, and what is and what do we get in return? Nothing. Well, well, what he's done is he's given you know he's given Kim Jong Un exactly what he wanted, and that is a primary place on the world stage, which right. wouldn't normally be given to someone who has a country that small with that few people. I mean, they only have about what fifteen million people in North Korea, um, and uh, so consequently, it, it puts him on the world stage in a place where normally somebody of a country that size and a population that large would not be placed. Uh, I just think that Kim Jong-un is a bit stupid because it would do him a lot of good if he toned down the rhetoric and up the, come on into our country, come say hello, come see how wonderful Korea is. And he's got like a whole area there that, you know, a, a, Trump even mentioned it because he, I think he wants to build a hotel there. There's a thing called the, the North Korean uh, uh, Riviera, which is very nice. It's a very nice place for vacation spot. I saw 
documentary that uh, Michael Palin did about his trip to North Korea. And it was very eye-opening because you see Korea, North Korea in a way you don't normally see it. Yes, it's poor, it's destitute. Uh, Pyongyang is kind of looks wealthy, looks prosperous, but you get out of there and it's it's a pretty sad mess. But you get to that that uh, that Riviera, it's very nice, and they should be wanting to have uh, a lot of po people coming in on vacation and hanging out in Korea. Uh, but he's not taking advantage of that. Yes, uh, yes. Go ahead, Ray. We can't hear you. Muted. You're muted. You're muted, Ray. I know. I know. I know. Oh. <laughs> oh, he's afraid of being thrown out by the YMCA police. There, there now. Oh, oh okay. So it works. Um, yeah, I saw a documentary once uh, where these they have a ski a ski area in, in North Korea, and it's absolutely beautiful, pristine, like perfect, and nobody is there. Yeah. The only people that were skiing there were what, the what, documents. What was very it, funny? It was, it's top notch. Is Michael Nobody's Palin? There. Michael Palin had to catch this plane to go to some other place in Korea, and there was only one plane that came into this airport every day. And when he got to the airport, it was this brand new airport they had built with all the modern facilities and people yeah. at all the things like the information booth and so on. But nobody but him in the entire airport. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, it's hilarious. It was almost like he was doing a Monty Python routine. You know, I mean, it was very silly. Very silly. But they do that, you know. Uh, yeah. So, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, I, the thing I, about this documentary that impressed me was it actually is a very beautiful country. But the problem they have with it is something like 70% of it is mountains. And so they can't grow crops where there are mountains. And that's why they go through all these uh, starvation and so on, because all they can do is grow it on flat land. And then there they've had floods and things like that. So uh, they've, they've had nothing but problems. They could use an influx of tourism and people coming but nobody's going to come to a country where they think they can get arrested at any moment. So, you know, uh, that doesn't, <laughs> See, that doesn't, doesn't bode I almost, well. I almost think that that kind of – we prove our own point here because – and we also prove the reason that it's it's almost senseless to try to negotiate with someone like that because you say, and I agree, any normal person would say, yeah, they should be open for business, right? They should do business with the world because – it would benefit them. They could become wealthy. I mean, I believe that's the only reason Trump cares anyway. He wants people to go on vacation in North Korea and stay in a Trump hotel. I mean, but, you know, but even besides that point, yeah, they should let the world in and you should come stay in their hotels and along their coastline and ski there and do it. And that would be great. And that is what a rational person would want, right? Mm -hmm. But isn't that just proof? The fact that they walled themselves off from the He's not a rational person that you're dealing with, you know. The, I mean, the the uh, leader of North Korea. Okay. Rather than uh, prosper and get along with the world, he would rather isolate himself and weaponize. That, that's not a about, rational. <clears throat> well, he is power. He, he is irrational only because he was brought up in an atmosphere of irrationality. Sure. And, you know, I mean, a family. It's a family-run business that he took over. <laughs> you know, and he only knows one way to run it, and that's the way he was taught. Although he is, it's, it would be easier for us to win him over to our side because he did study where in Switzerland or London or someplace like that. The, his father sent him out of the country when he went to school. So he knows Western life and probably knows how to speak English pretty damn well, but doesn't want to speak it when he's dealing with negotiations. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, he was raised as an abused kid you know he was he was raised to believe that life was this way for him because he was a kim uh and and you got to know that some craziness is going to come out of that what are you going to do about that yeah. so there's a paranoia about remaining in power oh yeah so that's part of it too you don't want to open up too much you don't want the people you want the people to believe the shit that they believe about the Kim family. I mean, 
they don't believe that he defecates. They don't believe it. And you know something? It looks like he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> I just got that. <laughs> it just hit me. One shit, and that guy would be, uh, be, be as thin as you are, or I am. Um, as thin as Ray is, okay? That's what we'll use as the yardstick. Um, uh, uh, he, uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 he, uh, uh, what I saw in this documentary that Palin did, and it was a very good documentary because he didn't go in to do a hit piece on, on North Korea. He wanted to see what it was like and show his audience what it was like in reality. And he didn't make any pretense about the fact that it wasn't a closed country and there were things you couldn't say and things that people couldn't do. But he had handlers, and he went out to the country with one of these handlers, and they took a hike out in the country, beautiful place. I can't remember where it was exactly. Uh, but it was in the, one of the mountainous regions of a very mountainous country. And they're sitting there, and he's just talking with her because there's nobody around except he and his cameras, all right? And he started kind of delving into the mindset that she had as a North Korean. And she was a handler, so she had a very good job. And she was doing propaganda, basically. And he said to her, you know, uh, how do you look upon, why don't you criticize Kim Jong-un. And she said, Kim Jong-un is North Korea. I am a North Korean. If I insult or put down Kim Jong-un, I'm putting myself and my people down. That was her thinking about it. And, and, and if you think about it in that mindset, you begin to understand where they're coming from. You don't agree with it, but you know where they're coming from that an insult to Kim would be an insult to your fellow man who you live with, you know. They sound like Trump supporters. You, kind of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's why Trump and Kim get along so well. They have a bromance. So I was at this party on Saturday in uh, Tampa, and there seemed to be a lot of Trump supporters there. Mm -hmm. One of the guys showed up at the party, must have been about, I don't know, two two thirty in the afternoon. And, you know, nobody was talking politics, especially, you know, people avoid the whole Trump story. And he said, you know, I don't know if you guys want to discuss politics or not, if you're comfortable with it. But our president today, I just saw him. He was on television from the CPAC conference and he used the word bullshit. He did. On television yeah. multiple times. And I, I thought he was going to chastise him for it. And so I just shook my head like, yeah, that's our president. And then he said, I think it's refreshing. I love it. <laughs> oh, well, then, if you think it's refreshing, try this one on. Trump's full of bullshit. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Isn't it amazing the excuses they'll make for the man? You know, yeah, if, it it, if Obama it had used the word Obama. bullshit, we would have never heard the end of it. Yeah. Hugging the flag. It's all theatrics. It's scary. It's it scary. Is. It's scary. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, what's scary about it isn't so much Donald Trump as the fact that there are people that follow Donald Trump. There are people who voted for Donald Trump, that there are people who agree with Donald Trump, and that this is the kind of thing, you know, you wonder how the common German became a Nazi. Mm -hmm. Ta-da! Mm -hmm. You know? It, 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 and you don't see it coming, and it comes very slowly, but when it finally comes, you've got a whole population that's going, we love Trump, MAGA all the more way. And more, you're hearing more and more people who are, and I know Bill Maher started this about a year ago, but you're hearing more and more people say that if Donald Trump loses in 2020, it's not going to be easy to get him out of the White House. <clears throat> He's going to contest it. He's going to call it fixed. He is not going to go away quietly. Well, he's got to lose by such a large margin that it's impossible for him to argue it. <laughs> but, you know, you could be right. Yes, Tom. 
Well, getting on to that, I mean, he, he lost the popular vote by three million and he just declared them illegal votes. So he gets around that pretty easy. Mm -hmm. But I was just going to, to, to say, I, I think a lot of the problem is the, the tendency to want to normalize the situation. I mean, to the, say the fact that, that the Democrats are overreaching or overreacting. I mean, it's like we've, that we, we have not had it in my lifetime an administration as, it, as corrupt I mean, and bl doing blatantly illegal stuff, mm -hmm. and a lot of it. I mean, it makes sense to have these investigations. We should have been having them for the past two years, except that, the re as we said we were earlier, the Republicans were in charge, and they just let him go and do anything they want. They want to normalize it, and that's that's the that's the 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 the. the uh, I hate to say the cliche slippery slope, but that's what it is. I yeah. mean, it sort of allows us to accept, you know, what he's doing is okay, is normal. Everybody does it, you know. That's a part of the propaganda. Yeah. So I was, I was watching CNN today, and they kept interviewing. They were like, uh, there was one guy kept running up in the halls of the Senate and talking to different different Republican senators, asking them about uh, whether or not they would want to set up some sort of investigation to look into what we now know are illegal campaign contributions while he was in office. Not one Republican said, well, it's not in my top five. It's not something I would look at. And when, when pressed on it, like, well, let me ask you this. If this were a Democrat, if this were Hillary and this happened, or let's just talk about the fact that he is ramming security clearances down his family's throats, his daughter and his son-in-law, against everybody. If, if Hillary had given Chelsea and Chelsea's husband security clearances, the Republicans would go apeshit. And, and, and they, they just, it's okay. They don't care. They they talk around those points. I, I they're just as complicit. Yeah. Well, these people are not uh, haven't been brought in uh, as uh, as anybody of of uh, power. Uh, they've just been brought in, I imagine, as uh, consultants, right? Basically, I mean, that's You're talking what, about his family. Yeah, I'm talking about guys like Jared, for instance. What's that's his not, job? But, but the point is, he's still actively raising money for his father's business for 666 7th Avenue or 5th Avenue, whatever it is, that right. building is failing. Yeah, He's out, he's got the security clearances, he's in the government, and yet he's still working in private sector. It's unethical. By the way, I just want to mention something quickly. Uh, not having Phil here tonight, I feel like we're a bunch of people who are uh, being allowed to swim naked in a lake. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah. You know, that kind of freedom you feel when, you know, there isn't, we aren't sitting around having somebody go, oh, no, no, no. It's, uh, you know, to make all the standard excuses that people make for Trump. Uh, today I went over to Fox, watched Fox for a couple of minutes, and I just went, it's like a different world over here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they, they were, are looking, they, they will, it, it He's right. If he shot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue, they'd make an excuse for it. Well, the guy wasn't moving fast enough. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> you know? Uh, they were excusing everything. And, and of course, anything the Democrats did was all wrong. Yes, Tom? Well, did you hear that I actually killed the story about the payoffs? Yeah, to, they had uh, it. Yeah, they, they had the story in October of, of, of 16. And and the story was killed because Rupert Murdoch wanted to Trump get elected. What payoffs? The payoffs to the story annuals and the woman from Playboy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Oh, whatever her name was, I've forgotten. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. He they they had the story and they and they and they killed it. Well, you see that 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 what's so wrong about that is they're a news organization. And you just shouldn't allow yourself to do that, even if you're on the other side, you know. Well, there's no more. There's 
In the old days, the networks would have to contend with the FCC, who could mess with their renewals for their television stations, cause them all kinds of problems. Who is uh, who is the governing body to to well, keep them on track? Here's the, today? Here, here's the biggest problem that we have is that <clears throat> there was a time when news did not make a network money. No. Okay. It was a loss leader, but it was a loss leader they pointed to and said, look at our news division. Isn't that wonderful? C CBS took great pride of it and for years never made any money off of it. Hell, you know. Ed Murrow, who did some of the greatest documentaries for CBS, was a loss leader for them. They never made a penny off of Murrow. Uh, and now there's money in the news. And when there's money in the news, you're going to make all kinds of compromises in order to make that money and to not screw the pooch. And yeah. I, that goes for both sides. It goes for Fox. It goes for MSNBC. I mean, I'm so sick of MSNBC these days that I could puke because all I'm doing is getting it's the same story. It's the same mantra over and over and over again. Nobody's looking to discover anything. Nobody's looking to 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 find the truth in a given situation. They immediately take a side and then they doggedly stick to it and program after program, they keep talking about it over and over and over again. And I, I, I really, and this, where, where do you go to get decent news? I still think CNN and the 630 news on the networks. Yeah, but even they, here's what gripes me about the 630 news. For instance, yeah, we always watch NBC. Lester Holt's over, they have a tornado, they send Lester Holt out to where the tornado is. Maybe they're hoping he'll get he'll die or something, I don't know. Uh, but he goes out to where the tornado is, and now he's interviewing somebody who lost their child in the tornado the day before. And everything he was doing was trying to make them cry. Yeah, He was trying to elicit that that crying out of them like do you miss her questions like that of course they miss her you asshole then i just <laughs> thought it was absolutely cruel journalism and that's what bothers me about the 630 news and what also bothers me about the 630 news is you get 15 minutes of news and then 15 minutes of fluff you know yeah but at least it's it's yeah. not uh, an alternate universe like 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 fox can be <laughs> They try to be, they try to seem not uh, taking any side about anything, you know. They try to be even handed, but uh, it, it's still not very good journalism, even if they're trying to be non judgmental. Yes, Ray. Well, I know it's a hassle, but um, I have found that Al Jazeera to be the best. I'll just say that and get off of it. Well, Al Jazeera, it's isn't, it's a, Al Jazeera isn't on anymore. Uh, uh, I. Wait a minute, you're breaking up on us. Al, Al Jazeera isn't on in this country any longer. I watch it on the internet. I watch it on the internet. Yeah. Uh, I watch it on the internet. Yeah. And how are they? How do you feel? It's a hassle, though. Really even handed and fair. Really good. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is uh, I mean, I could say the BBC was pretty good, too. But uh, yeah. there's, there's a lot on the BBC that I just don't even care about. You know, here's what's happening in the Sudan and Africa today. Here's, here, here's our half hour of African news today. I don't care, okay? Because yeah, we he, as Americans don't care. Well, but no, in Europe, in, care some, I, was taught in, I was taught when I was taking journalism, and I think anybody who ever took, took, took journalism got this lecture, and that is that all news is proximity. Proximity is very important. Right. You know, people care more, as somebody said, about the dead cat outside the front window than they do about a dead baby in, in Guatemala, you know, because it's it, it's something that's right here and now. And uh, so I, I kind of agree with that philosophy, you know, that all news is proximity. And the trouble with the BBC is it loses that proximity, you know. But I do enjoy them. I do think they are more even-handed shall we say about most things so yeah P pbs is pretty good but i mean a, a pbs is news every night the pbs news hour is really good yeah but it goes to the point that you're saying but it's very dry and it's just the straight yeah. this is the news so 
And so I guess if people say, well, I don't like that, well, then that goes to what you were saying earlier as to where they want their news with some jazz. You know, <laughs> you know I, I think actually where I would go if I thought about it would be uh, to uh, uh, say someplace like YouTube or wherever where I could just get the news clips and then I could watch the clips and I could then make up my own mind rather than watching the clip and having somebody then interpret it for the next 10 minutes. That's what I do because I don't have have the TV, CNN, and all that. I just watch the clips on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, where do you go? It saves Tom? time. Where do you go for your news, Tom? Well, uh, PBS News Hour, as, as uh, Josh said, I also I do listen to NPR a lot. I do uh, enjoy listening to the BBC. Um, I, you know, the BBC is available on on the Sirius XM app. Mm -hmm. I also, KQED here, uh, broadcast uh, BBC News. I listen that way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then I get a lot of news online. Uh, but I I gave up on the on the cable news networks a long time ago. Uh, my, my main beef with, with, with well, with all, with, with all of them that are politically, you know, uh, you know, focused, is right. the fact that yeah, I mean and that they're 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 very shallow. All they talk about is American politics, and 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 what's really uh, frustrating about MSNBC is it it validates the Fox News uh, premise that all news is biased. So like when Fox News came on, they said they they, they were coming with the conser with the conservative philosophy that all news was biased. To the left, right? right? So they they so I always interpreted their 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 fair and balanced mantra to be, we're being fair, we're 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 being fair to the right, and therefore we're providing the balance of broadcasting our point of view that isn't being broadcast by the other side. So but, what does MSNBC do? It says okay, well they're right wing news, we'll be left wing news. <laughs> yeah, and so once again they're validating that premise. That that there is a bias in news. Now, certainly everybody has a bias, yeah. right? The the professional journalist works to counteract that balance of bias and look for uh, facts that contradict it and make and, and evaluate and pre present what the, the 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 audience needs to know, regardless of what that person's bias I, is. I, okay, let me let me for a moment say to you that the thing that I guess bothers me is it used to be that those newscasts during the day were newscasts. Okay. Mm -hmm. They told you what the news was. They, they ran different news stories. The idea of 24 hours, seven days a week of news at nighttime, you had the commentaries. You had the people who had the opinion. Okay. And those were the opinion programs. Slowly, all of that has changed. And if you look at a place like MSNBC, it's opinion all day long. Okay. Mm -hmm. I go over to Fox. I got to say this. Occasionally, I bump into one of their news programs that is an opinion. That's just reporting the news. I, I know that sounds strange, but like, for instance, yeah. uh, uh, Brett Baer is basically news and doesn't isn't sitting there expressing his opinion. Uh, what's his name? The other guy they love over there. Uh, Jeff Smith. Uh, uh, Smith uh, what's his name? Shepard Smith. Shepard, Shepard Smith, right. Shepard Smith is as even-handed a news reporter as you can find in the business. I mean, if any outfit is maybe even-handed at times, it's Fox. And I, I know that sounds strange, but it's true, you know. Yeah. Well, the, the times I watch Fox is actually when, uh, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our local uh, TV station uh, in Oakland, KTVU, is actually a Fox affiliate. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll see Fox News through their, you know, I watch the, the evening news mostly to watch, you know, for local news and weather. Mm -hmm. But I'll I'll watch their 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 their, you know, their their correspondents deliver pretty straight news. Uh, I, I remember one year I watched uh, uh, State of the Union when, well, with Obama that was uh, being hosted by uh, Chris Wallace. Yeah. You know, it seemed pretty straight up you know just well i i just find that occasionally when i tune into fox i'm not getting 
uh, opinion like I'm getting on on MSNBC. I mean, on, some of their shows seem to come across as just straight news shows. Mm -hmm. uh, like today, I think there was a big story, and they did report it, all of them, but they didn't report it to the to the extent that it should have been reported. And that's the uh, that's the vaccine story. They held a hearing in Washington about vac about the measles vaccine. And they had this one kid who was very articulate who got up and talked about the fact that his mother didn't want him to get the vaccine. So he overrode her and on the side without her knowing it went and got the vaccine because he didn't want to get the measles. Mm -hmm. And the mother didn't want him to have the measles vaccine because she had read people like Jenny McCarthy, that cunt, yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, saying that it causes autism. Now, a international report came out studying, I think it was 200,000 kids in Norway or wherever. I mean, an amazing, huge study that said there is no correlation between vaccines and autism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely none. In fact, in this study, they found that among the people that had the vaccine, the measles vaccine, there was less autism. <laughs> so really the whole autism thing has been disproven not just this time but in several other studies yeah. and yet mothers like this kid's mother and uh, because she probably listens to the, the cunt Jim, Jenny McCarthy who has made more kids sick than healthy uh, say that it causes autism uh, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, it purely doesn't and the kid got up in front of Congress and said I, I disobeyed my mother and I went and got the vaccine, and everybody should get the vaccine because too many kids are getting the measles, mm -hmm. you know, because people aren't vaccinating their kids. Um, at what point does the government step in and say, hey, listen, you know, you got to get the vaccine, unless you got a religious reason to not get the vaccine. Well, you got to have the vaccine. can do it. You huh? can't attend school unless you're vaccinated. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can fight it by saying, I have a religious objection to this and they'll say well i guess uh, then your kid can come to school but the fact is the kids come to school with the measles and everybody else gets it because they didn't get the vaccine yes and i think really if you're gonna have your kid in school i mean if there's a controversial vaccine but the measles vaccine has never been controversial it's been working for years. you know except you had people like jenny mccarthy spreading these blatant lies that it caused autism and it clearly didn't never did you know so i mean what do you what do you do about these people you know what do you do about this and how do you solve the problem and here we got uh we got congress holding a holding a hearings on the thing why are, why do we even have to waste our time i got vaccinations when i was a kid why so i wouldn't get the diseases that i they were vaccinating me against you know, I, I, we didn't have a measles vaccine back in those days, so I got the measles. You know. mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, come on. Uh, I, I, I get every shot possible, you know. Have you gotten the uh, the, the vaccine for, um, what's the, the shingles? Shingles, have you yeah. That? Yeah, I've gotten it. Yeah, I've yeah. gotten yeah. both of them. Did it make you sick? No, no. I got it. I had to had one, and then they got a hold of me the next time. It was time for me to get another one. They said, w w you know, it's very they they're very the shingles vaccine, especially I think the second one, very hard to lay for them to lay their hands on. So the when they do, they call you and say, "Come on in if you want it. You got to get it within the next twenty four hours because we're going to give it to somebody else." So we went and got our second shingle shot, and I never got uh, sick off of it. I don't remember getting sick off of it. I've heard people say they've gotten sick from it because my doctor wants me to get it. No, I, I would do it. I would do it. I got shingles once. You don't want it. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah. Uh, yes, Tom. Biggest problem with getting a shingles vaccine is getting the insurance company to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> really? I went to I had a real, I had a problem. I had another friend who had even a more problem. I mean, he was with, uh, I think it was Anthem Blue Cross. He had a Real difficult time to get uh, to get his. He finally did. He succeeded in getting insurance uh, to cover the shot. But 
for some reason, they don't want to do it. Mine covered it know. without any problem at all. Yeah. Well, well, things have changed since then. Well, no, I have <laughs> Medicare. I have Medicare. So, how, how often do you need that? Is it just the one time thing? No, you get once, and then you have to get it about a year later, something like that. No, I mean, once you've gotten the two shots. Oh, you're, I think you're set. For life. for life yeah i would imagine i don't i don't know maybe another 10 years something like that but it's, it's a long period of time that i do know have you gotten the shingles shot at all uh jeff yes yeah. yes i don't think i've had a second i've gotten the shingles. one yet i've gotten the shingles i've gotten the pneumonia and that's all been when i've gotten my flu shots i've gotten those other things too mm. so boy did my arms hurt yeah <laughs> really yeah yeah but uh, uh, but I just I just think that uh, uh, parents who, who who believe you see I mean it, what it is it's the internet you know we think the internet is this wonderful blessing and what it is it is a <laughs> massive true. amount of misinformation yeah. and these parents are not getting their kids vaccinated because they read online unverified material that your kid will get autism if you give them a give them a shot. And, and, of course, a parent's going to respond to that because if they don't know better, they care about their child, you know. Absolutely. Yes, Tom. I say this is one of the weird intersections where the extreme left and the extreme right mm -hmm. uh, end up in the same camp. You'll find the anti-vaxxers in both, you know, people who are real uh, far on the left and people really far on the right. <laughs> it's like... Is it the far fringes of either of those, though, that, yeah, that are the anti-vaxxers? Yeah, the the anti-vaxxers are both both of those. Well, yeah. then what they are is they're people who are uh, zealots, okay? I mean, if, if you're far to the left and really far to the right, you're a zealot. And so you're going to be mm -hmm. a zealot about anything, and you're going to find out something about vaccinations, and you're going to become a zealot about it, whether you're left or whether you're right. It's not a left or right issue. It should be, but it's become one. <laughs> it, it, is it? I mean, I, well, I they make it into one. I know? mean, I but think it, I could. Like any, it's like climate change. I mean, climate change should not be a left-right issue either. I mean, it's a scientific issue. Well, they, they, uh, 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 who was I saw Rand Paul uh, at, at uh, one of these at this hearing, and and he said that uh, uh, he said that he he felt that the government saying you had to get the shot was wrong. But uh, and that is a doctor. Uh, I mean, he goes out and he gets these shots for himself. But uh, he said that uh, he doesn't believe the government should be in the in the in the in the business uh, of doing this sort of thing. You know, well, I disagree. Uh, uh, and it, well, he you know him. He doesn't believe the government should do anything, huh? Yeah, he's a libertarian. He's a libertarian, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so. Uh, I, um, you know, it's it's pretty uh, ridiculous that, you know, the people won't vaccinate their kids because they're harming other kids by not doing it. Right. You right. know, and that's the basic thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, then and then you got these Jenny McCarthy's running around, you know, passing out just bogus information, bogus science. And uh, if you're a parent, you don't know what to do. Yes, Tom. Why just say, well, Jay McCarthy? I mean, even uh, Donald Trump is as an anti vaxxer isn't he? I don't think or, so. He hangs out he, he, with uh, Alex Jones and, and all them. Yeah. Well, uh, Al well Alex Jones is not. Trump doesn't hang. Does he hang out with Alex Jones? I don't think he he's uh, he's in yeah, yeah. the Alex Jones camp. He's I know I know that Stone was. You know. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know that Trump was uh, is an anti-vaxxer particularly. You know, I don't quite, between you and me, to be very honest, I don't think Donald Trump has an opinion about anything. <laughs> I really don't. I think Donald Trump has an, takes a side that he thinks is going to benefit him. Yeah. And that's it. He doesn't. Yeah. He, he is as agnostic politically as you can possibly get. And he ran as a conservative because he saw that as the empty spot. Mm -hmm. He didn't see it on the other side. And he right. saw it as the people he could grab. But I don't think he has any politics. Does anybody here believe he does? Well, it by that's... One, huh? I think he gives a rat's ass about religion and God and churches or any of that. Yeah, no. He's it, just... 
He, listen, <laughs> they're, they're gullible. He's he's yeah. one of the first presidents I can remember in recent times that doesn't go to church on Sundays. Yep. You know, they all went to church on Sundays, even if they didn't like going, just to look good. You know, so anyway. He plays golf. Instead. Yeah. Hey, listen, this has been nice. And as I say, it's like swimming naked, you know? Uh, we felt the freedom to say what we had to say and go anywhere we had to go with this thing and not be dragged and kicking and, kicking and screaming in any particular direction. <laughs> Uh, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. And it's another night that Skype is still working. I figured out how the new Skype works, but it would be, it's going to be so much trouble to work to put it together and to get it on the screen. I can do it, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's a hot mess. It really is. Uh, but there's a, I finally figured out how you put together a citizen panel. Of course, I'll have to put all of you in a list ahead of time, and Gabnet will show up on your on your Skype. Uh, but it's oh, it's just so that means you get you have no ability to get new uh, callers. Well, if I get a new caller, I then I guess hang up on them, and then I call them back and add them to the group. Okay, uh, it can be done. It's just it's all more clumsy, and and to create a panel on the screen is even clumsier. Because I don't use, can't use the Skype to do it. I have to use a whole bunch of programming to put different pictures on the screen of each of you. Oh, oh it's, it's a mess. Uh, <laughs> but I'll do it if I have to do it that way. You know, we'll basically just talk to each other and hope that we get the video out. Anyway, I want all of you to say good night. Uh, Charlie, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, uh, Rob, a pleasure as usual. Ray Renati, great. Josh, love having you here. Jeff and Tom, the coast is clear, you know. You can call for the next two weeks and not have any fear uh, uh, of retribution. Your family will not be endangered in any way. <laughs> so anyway, everybody, uh, give a big, uh, a big wave goodbye to the audience out there. Uh, so they can uh, know that you love them and that you care about them. And I'll wave back. And there we go. There they go. There We've lost them now. Uh, they're off for the night. I will hang up on them rudely uh, and make the lines available for the intersection with Jack Bishop, which follows immediately. Next, on most of these same gab nets, uh, tomorrow night, hey, it's the uh, sports show, the arena at 8.30 East, uh, Eastern Time. And then at 9.30, Damien's back. And then I'll be back again tomorrow night. Same time, same station in life at 10 o'clock. And in the meantime, if you see her, you know, tell her I love her, okay? Bye. Bye.